Uh, I'd like to be grateful again to Dr. Yuko. Uh, we are in his personal home. So it can be, because it's so beautiful, because the setting is so beautiful, the buildings are so beautiful, and everything here is so well done and so professional, we might think this is a hotel yeah. or, or a professional establishment, and it is a personal home. So um, I'm so grateful for, for this opportunity. Uh, when you see Dr. Hugo, if you express your gratitude, that would be wonderful. Um, it's important to remember there are no services here because it's a, it's a home, it's not a hotel. And uh, maybe a hotel would make income if you were gaining services in the hotel. Dr. Hugo is expending income to serve us. So, so we really need to be grateful to him for that. Um, also, if we could all remember to help out when we can. Uh, students, please, other students here, any scholarship students in the room? Wonderful. Uh, please look for opportunities to help. Uh, we should treat this like we're in someone's home. Imagine you're in the home of, uh, uh, of a parent or, or a friend's parent. Um, above all, please attend all sessions and on time. And if you are a student, it, it, uh, please meet with Joe Kent during the break. Uh, he'll, he'll coordinate some, some things with you. Um, if you're a scholarship student, please, please do meet with him. Okay, a guidebook. I've been learning about guidebook. I downloaded it before I came. It's a wonderful app. It's fantastic. I don't know if you've, you've had some opportunity to, to check it out, but please do use it as much as possible to, to check what's happening, who the speakers are, what's... Uh, uh, what, we'll, we'll actually have some PowerPoints going up on there. It's important that you, like yesterday we mentioned, please fill out your schedule for today. There are three current, concurrent sessions. We'd like to know how many seats to put in different places, so please do fill that out. And there's, a, there's actually a part of the app to evaluate the sessions. So click on the schedule, and there's a five-point, five-star system. Please rate the, the sessions. You can also see how other people are rating them. It's anonymous, so you don't have to worry that Tom is going to think poorly of you when you put a one on his session. Um, so it's anonymous, but you can see how other people are rating those sessions. Okay, so uh, without further ado, Tom Palmer is a man who needs no introduction, but he's someone who deserves one, certainly. He is Executive Vice President of International Programs at Atlas Network a senior fellow at Cato Institute and a director of Cato University. He's published many articles and books, including Realizing Freedom, Libertarian Theory, History, and Practice, The Morality of Capitalism, and most recently, Peace, Love, and Liberty. He's a great friend of liberty. I, I don't think anyone could top him in, in importance in our movement, in my opinion. Most of all, Tom is a true gentleman and a scholar, a man of great learning, style, and panache. And so I'd like to invite him to give us a session this morning on control, state control, or self-control. Well, thank, thank you, Andrew, for the uh, extraordinarily warm introduction. And I'd also like to personally thank Dr. Hugo also for inviting us into his home to talk about an uh, issue of such importance to him and his life, which is the freedom of every human being live their lives according to their own lives. And also to mention, I did not expect it, but I'm such a great fan of ISIL, they get such bad press in the last two years, and now I meet ISIL and you're not as I expected at all. <laughs> so really, it's a, a great opportunity to meet uh, freedom lovers, yeah. and I'm a big fan of... Um, they don't do the right. Did you read it? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm a great fan of what uh, Ken, Lee, and Jim, and the others have been doing to advance liberty. It's very admirable. I'm going to talk about a topic that doesn't get enough attention, and it's about the relationship between freedom and responsibility. Some of our critics, anti-libertarian thinkers, say, oh, you libertarians think 
people should do anything they want, anytime, no matter what it causes, it hurt or harm to other people. And that's not true. To be a free person means also to be a responsible person. And I want to revisit this relationship between personal responsibility and personal freedom. I have a book that's going to come out, we're hoping in a very early uh, 2016, in January, State Control or Self-Control. And we're going to make it uh, available all around the world. It's uh, about what personal responsibility is and its relationship to liberty. It's part of a series of books that I've been editing and I have some copies over here. You can take them. They're not free, but the price is zero. <laughs> well, you didn't have to pay for them, but the price to you is zero. And they're made up of short essays. You don't have to read the whole book. It's not human action. It's not going to sit on your shelf making you feel guilty for year after year after year. <laughs> there are short essays that you can read. If you read one, it's okay. If you read two, that's better. But you don't have to read them all. Uh, we did this one, The Morality of Capitalism. It's not quite up to uh, 10 standards yet, over 50 translations, but we're at 36. So it's a race. Uh, and uh, uh, we have more languages coming out. Uh, the next one, After the Welfare State. Uh, which is also a topic of interest to us, and I'll address it briefly. Why liberty? Which is a basic, simple introduction to libertarian ideas for everybody. And then, the most recent, Peace, Love, and Liberty. Now, I should mention there are copies here, but also, you can download the whole PDF. So, look at the title of the book, go to the internet, put the title, and then PDF, and you can download the whole book. And anyone who wants to translate it, come talk to me, no problem. We'll send you the relevant documents. And the price for translation is zero. Uh, so uh, we're happy to see that happen. Now, it's the new book is going to have original essays that I've commissioned by Philip Booth and Steve Davies from the United Kingdom. Jeffrey Myron, I'll talk about his contribution. He's an economist at Harvard, free market economist, who focuses on the dangerous consequences of drug prohibition and why drug legalization is so important. Uh, Jeffet Omojua from Nigeria talking about why we should hold governments accountable for their behavior. They get away with everything. To believe in responsibility believe, means we believe governments and politicians should also be accountable. Lisa Conyers, who's the author of a new book coming out on the human cost of welfare, myself. Uh, Dr. Sarah Squire, she's at Liberty Fund. She's going to talk about personal responsibility and literature, why that's important, because in my opinion, we need art and literature and beauty on our side as well. The other side is that too many of the artists, we need artists and literary figures advancing liberty as well. John Tierney, science writer for the New York Times, Nira Badwar, she's a philosopher, uh, Tibor Makan, another philosopher, Nima Sanandaji, as you can see for his name, his Swedish. Uh, originally born in Iran, but he is a Swedish economist, has a great new book that just came out from Institute of Economic Affairs on the Scandinavian model. Also, you can download Dr. Lynn Keasley. She's an economist at the Northwestern University. Now, when you mention responsibility, what is it that most people think today? That it's boring. That it's about old people scolding you to be responsible. And to talk about responsibility, they believe, is to be boring. And I think that they're completely wrong about this. Being responsible is a great adventure in life, to take responsibility for your own life. And when we deny responsibility, we deny freedom. And when we deny freedom, we deny responsibility. The two are very intimately connected. And I'll talk briefly about some of these issues from a historical perspective, the deep relationship between personal responsibility and the idea of liberty, the role of freedom in generating good moral character. To be a better person is easier in a free society than in a controlled and violent one. Why it's exciting to take personal responsibility and then the generation of responsibility coming. Now the first point, when we think about personal freedom, and the idea of individual rights, where does it come from? In many cultures and societies, it's rooted in the idea of personal responsibility. 
in the Confucian tradition and the Taoist tradition, you find it in Indian literature, and you find it in European literature as well. This idea of being a free person. One of the popes, Innocent IV, addressed this question in the year 1250. And he said, dominium means personal mastery, to be master of yourself. And possession and jurisdiction can belong even to infidels. So he's a Christian pope. But he said, we must respect the Muslims and the Jews and the others. They are capable of personal responsibility. And freedom is not made only for the faithful, only for his fellow Christians, but is for every rational creature. That's a very important point, and you find it also in Islam and other religious traditions, that to be a moral person is what counts for having rights, for having personal responsibility and freedom. We are moral agents because we can be held accountable for our actions. If you go and hurt another person, you're responsible for it. As John Locke said, we own our actions. It's a very odd way to phrase it, isn't it? Normally you think we own a thing, like I own the book. But Locke said the most important thing you own is what you do and how you behave. It's what makes you a kind of person. And also, we are not just things in the world. For rulers and politicians to dispose of us, to throw us away. Every human being is precious because every human being is a source of moral responsibility. Everybody counts in the libertarian perspective. We find Francisco de Vitoria, one of the great pioneers of the idea of human rights. He was Spanish and also Christian, but he said what was being done to the Indians, the people of the what they called the New World, was a crime, a savage, brutal crime against them. And he stood up for them. He said that a person is master of his own actions when he can make choices. And he said the Indians, the people of Mexico and Guatemala, North and South America, they are masters of their actions. We must respect them and not harm them. They are not madmen. They have judgment like <coughs> other men. And that was what mattered to him, that they were not things or animals. They're human beings. And the Spanish who stood up for this, also Bartolome de las Casas, who spent his whole life defending the oppressed people of the New World. And he said that the past, because it cannot be undone, must be attributed to our wickedness, so long as what has been taken is restored that they must be restored to what is theirs. That is the foundation for the human rights tradition that formed liberalism as it emerged into the modern world. The English had a group called the Levelers, also influenced by the Spanish scholastics, and these were the first maybe really radical libertarians in Europe. They believed everyone had equal rights. They believed women had equal rights, which was considered crazy at the time. What do you mean, women having rights? But there were women levelers, and they stood up for their rights. They were so radical, they believed, and I know this is considered extreme even today, they were Englishmen, and they believed even Irish people have rights. <laughs> Which was a little extreme at the time. But if you go to a place in England called Burford, you will see where the levelers were executed, they were shot because they refused to invade Ireland. They said, we will not do it. You cannot make us do a wicked thing. The Irish were Catholic, the English were Protestant. They said, let's go kill the Catholics. And these levelers said, no, it's wicked and bad to do that. And you cannot make us do this bad thing. We are free men from the tops of our heads to the bottoms of our feet. We are free people and we will not do it. And they paid with their lives because they believed in the freedom of other people. As Richard Overton put it, when he was in prison in 1646, to every individual in nature is given an individual property by nature. For everyone, as he is himself, so he has a self-propriety. Else could he not be himself. 
To be yourself means you have rights over your own freedom. If you lose those rights, you cannot truly be yourself. You become an extension of the master of another ruler. And this principle is a very important one. We are sometimes criticized by our critics as selfish. Oh, you care about the individual. But which individual do you care about? You can care about yourself, but you also care about the freedom of other people. To take a very simple example, I don't smoke drugs. I don't like it. I admit, when I was very young, I tried it. Marijuana. I like every American president. <laughs> but I didn't like it. It's not part of my life. It did not appeal to me. But I'm very angry when other people are put in prison because they own a plant. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. It's wrong to do that. It does not affect me. I could go about my life. I don't smoke marijuana. I don't have it in my house. But I'm very angry when other people are punished for this. And I realized not too long ago, I have spent 42 years working for legalization of drugs. 42 years. I started in 1973 with a club for legalizing narcotics. And uh, no one in our club took any. <laughs> the other club on our college campus, they all smoked pot. They were the ones who were on the other side of the debate. <laughs> we didn't, but we believed in freedom. And now we're winning in many countries. We are finally beginning to win. And it was worth it. It was worth every day of that struggle. If someone doesn't go to prison, they have their life ruined because of a stupid law violating their rights. But uh, Joaquim Nabucco, a great Brazilian abolitionist, put it very neatly. He spent his whole life working to abolish slavery in Brazil. Brazil was the last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery. And this man was very important in that fight. He worked tirelessly. And he put it very neatly in his book on the topic. Educate your children, educate yourselves in the love for the freedom of others. That's not what our critics think we believe in. They think we believe only in my freedom. But to be a libertarian means I believe in my freedom, but I believe in your freedom. That is the test, to believe in the freedom of other people. Only in this way will your own freedom not be a gift from faith. When you believe in the freedom of other people, then you will be aware of its worth, and you will have the courage to defend it. So, most of us are not from North Korea. Some of us are. But all of us are hurt in our hearts when we think about the suffering of those people. It hurts us to think that they suffer such inhuman brutality. In addition, it helps us to develop good habits when we are free. Albert J. Nock wrote a wonderful essay about prohibition of alcohol when it was illegal in America and it was legal in Britain. He said, I went to Britain and people behaved very well. The prohibitionist only sees the drunk lying in the street and does not see the sober people living their lives responsibly. And freedom is a necessary condition for being a person of good moral character. It's also led to terrible consequences when we make these things illegal. For example, because we make drugs illegal, we have lots of poisoning. There's no brand name. I went to the local bar here, and I had a drink last night, and I didn't die. <laughs> I didn't die. Because it came from a brand that we know, we respect, there's brand, reputation, and liability, legal liability, if it was poisonous. But if someone goes to an illegal drug market, they can die. Because you don't know what's in the drug, there's no market, there's no court system. You can't take the person to court and say, I bought illegal drugs from this guy, and I got sick. The court is going to say, okay, you're under arrest now. <laughs> they won't respect your rights. We've seen because of the welfare state a decline in personal savings. People don't plan for the future as much because the big government is going to take care of me. Why should I? This has led to very bad consequences. 
we've seen in the pension plans around the world, because the state took them over, huge unfunded liabilities, gross irresponsibility. And now you're watching in the news about Greece every day. This is the welfare state in action, accumulating debts and debts and debts and debts. None of those politicians will be held accountable for bankrupting the country. This is the consequence of letting the state take responsibility for our lives. And even if we think about such a simple thing as vaping, everyone know what vaping means? It's like smoking but with vapor. Smokeless um, nicotine. It's much less harmful than smoking, but all around the world they're making it illegal. Why? Because it's pleasurable to some people. And this angers some others. Why not let them choose what they want to do? And as it happens, vaping is much safer than smoking. Look at the consequences of the war on drugs. Denial of our personal freedom has led to horrifying consequences. In 2013, how many people died of drug overdoses in the U.S.? 43,982. In the United Kingdom, 2,955. Almost every single one was because it's illegal. Very few people die of beer overdosing. <laughs> it does happen sometimes, but it's very unusual. Almost every one of those people was killed by the war on drugs. And then the other consequence that is an absolute horror. In Mexico, since 2006, over 100,000 people have been killed by drug gangs because it's illegal. Unfortunately, in the United States, which is the cause of this problem, American government, they don't see all those dead people because they're in Mexico. But Mexico alone, over 100,000 people. And the other terrible consequences of the war on drugs in Guatemala, in Honduras, in Colombia, and elsewhere. A monstrous, monstrous price to be paid for a foolish policy. Now, some people say, oh, if it's free choice, everyone will do it. Is it true? No. Well, we can look at the evidence. Let's look at the Dutch experience in terms of smoking drugs. This is the United States, where it's illegal. This is the Netherlands, where it's easy to get. The Dutch people use it less frequently. If you want to go buy marijuana in the Netherlands, it's easy. If you want to buy it in the United States, it's very difficult. You have to go to two places, prison or high school. <laughs> Those are the two places you can get drugs easily. The two places where it's the most illegal, by the way. And yet, the Dutch use it much less than the United States. We can compare USA to Netherlands consistently. Where it's illegal in the US, people use it more than where it's legal in the Netherlands. The claim is not true, that if you legalize it, everyone will take it. Now, Jeffrey Myron from Harvard has a chapter in the book that I commissioned. He's a great scholar of the war on drugs. And I asked him for an original essay. And here's what he raised as a question. Some people say, oh, if everyone were rational, you could legalize drugs. But they're not. Because some people are irrational, we must ban it. And he shows conclusively, even if you believe some people are irrational, or even many people are irrational. The worst response is to make it illegal. Why? Irrational people are more likely to take high risks. They're the ones who go into the dangerous neighborhood. They're the ones who use needles two, three, four, five times. They're the ones who suffer the bad consequences. So as he pointed out, if everyone's rational, there's no argument for the war on drugs. People will make the best choice for themselves. But if some people are irrational, it's a stronger argument for legalization, not a weaker one. It's a really great chapter, and I'm looking forward to its publication. Well, prohibition may prevent some users from consuming drugs. Prohibition makes more dangerous, makes use more dangerous and more costly for those who consume despite prohibition. It's worse even if people are irrational. The welfare state, the other flip side, and I have several chapters on this, 
has been undermining personal responsibility for a long time. This is the data on entitlement spending in the United States and how it has been rising. The blue line is entitlements. The others are defense and uh, interest payments and so on. So entitlements have been going up. More and more people living from the state. What we've seen, a very good book by uh, Jagadish Gokhale points out the government is accumulating huge unfunded liabilities. They are accumulating very rapidly in all of the welfare states around the world. And this system is a pyramid scheme. The number of the people at the base of the pyramid has to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But that's not happening. Population growth has slowed and gone negative in many countries. Japan, various European countries. And the consequences, these systems are going to begin collapsing more and more rapidly. The Greek future is waiting for all of us. These unfunded liabilities have been accumulating quite dramatically. The data I have in the book, it's a little bit hard to read on this small screen. But they are a huge multiple of the official debt held by the public. So government debt is what people focus on. But the unfunded liability is sometimes as much as 14 times bigger than the official debt. That is to say they promise to pay for you when you're old and gray, but it's only a promise. It's a promise to tax young people today, but the base of the pyramid is getting smaller in most of those countries. It won't be possible. Now this was known at the beginning. This man bears some responsibility for it. Alko von Bismarck, one of the most famous fashion models of the 19th century, and the German Chancellor, and the creator of the modern welfare state. And they pointed out the, the liabilities would accumulate gradually. At the beginning of a welfare state, it looks great, because you have a small number of people receiving benefits. You think, how happy. But toward the end of the welfare state, it's a catastrophe because the liabilities accumulated slowly. Bismarck knew that at the very moment it was conceived. That the problem would be 25 or 30 years in the future and he would be dead. <laughs> so what was he to worry about? This is a problem of welfare states all around the world. They erode personal responsibility. And I'll give you some example from three parts of the world. The Nordic countries, the US, and Australia, which is fairly nearby. Let's look at disability payments. So in countries that have increasing lifespan, people are living longer and they're healthier. What would we expect permanent disability payments to do? They would fall. People don't need it, right? Because they're living longer. It's not true. Personal disability payments, which is to receive a lifetime income without working, are going up in all of those countries. We can look at disability benefits in various countries, comparing them from 2007, mid-1990s, and in the most advanced welfare states, these figures are higher. Just to say, disability payments are increasing in those welfare states. Also, people with disability who are employed are falling in such countries as well. What that means is more and more people are willing to live at the expense of somebody else. This sense of personal responsibility is slowly being eroded by the welfare state. And by the way, I should add that there are two reasons that account for almost 100% of the increase in disability. Number one is emotional condition. People say, I'm too depressed to work. I get depressed sometimes too, but I still work. <laughs> the second is back pain. I have a lot of back pain, but I still work. Those are the two things that are very subjective. There's no obvious objective measurement of it. And they're the ones that have been increasing dramatically. People say, I shouldn't work because I have back pain and I have, I'm in a bad mood. And the consequence is, costs for more and more people. And this is in Australia as well, looking at the percentage of people receiving long-term 
uh, disability. Now, if you think about the American welfare state, this is what is happening in the U.S. This is the percentage of households where people receive welfare benefits. Not Social Security, not Medicare, which are universal entitlements, but what are called means-tested. You have to be poor to get it. This is not because people are becoming more poor. It's because more people are willing to live at the expense of someone else. And it is quite shocking now uh, that it's getting up to one-third of the population. It lives in a household receiving means-tested benefits. Now here's the question, what's wrong with this picture? This is the, the chance of dying before the age of 65. It's going down. People are living longer. This is the percentage of people receiving permanent disability payments. There's something wrong with that picture. We would expect, if this is going down, this ought to go down as well. It's not. They're going in opposite directions. So the chance of being injured or dying is falling, and the chance of going on permanent disability is rising. There's something wrong with this scissors picture, if you will. And of course, who's paying for these entitlements? This is the budget deficit going up. That's debt being accumulated by future generations. So these are present, present beneficiaries, and this is future taxpayers. It's unfair, simply unfair to make young people pay for those benefits. Now, there's good news. We can develop personal habits that will help us to lead better lives. There are techniques I'll talk about. We can make better decisions and take control of our lives. John Tierney, the science writer for the New York Times, has a chapter in the book on exactly this. It's a useful book. It's how to live a better life. And then, there's bad news. Sadly. And the bad news is, Governments insist you should not have freedom or responsibility. They want us to be dependent on them, and they want us to obey them. And we have to struggle to be independent and free persons. Now, I want to focus just for a minute on the good news. You can improve your moral fiber. This book by John Tierney and Roy Baumeister from Princeton called Willpower. I love this book. It's a great book. It's not just about how to be a better person. It's about the science of the brain and how to achieve control over yourself. And see, points are research into willpower and self-control is psychology's best help for contributing to human welfare. I really recommend this book. It's on Kindle. It's an easy book to read. It's fascinating. It's good science. And it's very helpful. So, one of the points he points out is willpower is scarce. You use it up. That's why Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook has only one kind of clothes he wears. A gray t-shirt and blue jeans. You open the closet in his house. I've never been there, but I'm told. And there's nothing but dozens and dozens of gray t-shirts and blue jeans. Why? He says, I make a lot of difficult decisions every day. I don't want to spend my time <laughs> deciding what to wear. Does the tie go with the pants and the shirt and the pocket square? Uh, so I economize on decision making. I always wear the same thing. I don't recommend that for you, especially in Indonesia. You see, I like batik. It's so beautiful. But remember, when you make a lot of decisions, after making those decisions, your ability to make them is lower. So you want to economize on it. You want to look for symptoms of willpower depletion. Don't make decisions when you're angry or tired or grumpy or hungry. We know this. Your grandmother told you this. But now scientists tell it. So your grandmother was a scientist. She knew. Don't make decisions when you're angry or tired or hungry. Because your willpower will be weak. You'll make bad decisions. Pick your battles. Make to-do lists. Effective people have to-do lists. All the things I need to do, and then reward yourself. Scratch it off. Feel good. I did it. You get a reward. 
You want to monitor yourself. There are all these great gadgets now to help you to monitor yourself. So I have a Fitbit. It tells me how many steps I've walked today. It's a small thing, but it reminds me, oh, I should take the stairs, not the elevator, because I didn't meet the number of steps I want to make today. A lot of ways to monitor your behavior, and you want to procrastinate wisely. For example, you want a cookie. It looks delicious. But you're worried about your weight? Okay. Don't eat the cookie, but promise you'll have one cookie tonight. <laughs> and you'll feel better. Why? Your mind is like a child. It wants a cookie now. Say so you'll get a cookie. But if you eat the cookie now, you'll eat five of them. We know this. So say no cookies now, and I'll have one cookie tonight. You'll be able to make better choices as a consequence. Reward yourself. Feel good about yourself when you do a good thing. Pat yourself on the back. Reward yourself for good choices. People don't do that enough. We can improve our human flourishing and virtue when we restore the relationship between freedom and responsibility. We allow property to make people responsible. We allow markets to make choices, or we make choices in markets, let me be more accurate about that. We don't demand other people pay for our benefits through the state. We hold people accountable for their behavior when it harms others. And the most people who are never held accountable are politicians. We should hold them accountable through the rule of law. And we want to replace the welfare state with a society of free and responsible individuals. Now I mentioned there's some bad news out there. We have to fight for our freedom and our responsibility. It won't come to us automatically. We have determined foes. They will question not only our data and our arguments, they systematically question our motivations. They say we're bad people because we believe in freedom. They question our patriotism, and they question our morality. And we have to stand up to that. We believe that if you can be a moral person and believe in freedom for everybody, that that is the moral thing to do. But every day that we delay the problem, it gets a little bit worse, especially with the welfare state. Every day we put this off, the problem is worse. Now, I mentioned that freedom is exciting also. I like this famous poem by William Ernest Henley. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. Each one of us has responsibility for our own lives. And there is a great excitement in doing that. Aristotle understood that moral freedom is necessary for there to be goodness and badness in the world. As he put in the Nicomachean Ethics, praise and blame are dependent on whether the people are compelled or not. If you do something because you're forced to, you get no credit for it. If you do it because you chose to do it, that is when we praise people for being good people. Freedom is the necessary ingredient. So if we want to stand up as human beings, let us demand and fight for our freedom, but also for our responsibility. That is the other side of the libertarian equation. Thank you very much. I think we have a little bit of time for some discussion, and I do want to encourage people to take copies of those books. I brought 50 pounds of books here in my luggage. I do not want to take them back. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, uh, they're there for you to take. Anyone want to raise any issues you'd like to discuss? Sir? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I wonder, in the case of um, a soldier, someone signing up, to become a soldier. Did you say in a sense that they're giving up their humanity because they're giving over the decision of life and death of themselves and others to someone else? And then they say, well, I'm just following orders. Well, what's your thought on that? Uh, Ken is very soft-spoken, so I'll say a little bit louder in case anyone did not hear. What about someone who becomes a soldier? They agree to follow orders. 
Do they lose moral responsibility? Do they lose their freedom in doing it? That's a very important question, and it is actually addressed in military ethics courses. The idea that you must do everything you are commanded, in my opinion, is a purely evil idea. If you join a group of people with some collective responsibility together with each other, and each one of you depends on the others, you do need to learn how to coordinate and even take orders. Firemen do this when they're saving someone in the house. They don't have a long discussion about what to do. The fire chief says, you, 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 go out there. And you have to be able to do that or people will die. But in the military, it is required in many countries that you be educated in how to obey illegal and immoral actions and how to identify them. So for example, in some militaries, not all, we know, courses are given how to identify an illegal order. Your commanding officer says, go over there and take care of the problem. That's a sign he's asking you to do something illegal and wrong. And you should report that to a higher officer and refuse. So there, these are, are practical questions also. I do not think you lose your moral responsibility because you're a policeman or a soldier. You still maintain it always because you're always a human being. And good policing institutions train people how to do the right thing, how to recognize an illegal and immoral order. So I think that these issues are deeply, deeply important. And they are addressed in at least some countries in the legal code and legal system. Time for one more, and then we've got to shut down. Yes, sir. Uh, from all the things that you said before, uh, going to the bad direction, our country now, I'm from Indonesia, and we subscribe to those things. We just ban uh, alcohol selling in the mini market, we just tighten the law, everything. So uh, we have a discussion in Manado with my friend, we are both libertarian, I think on the only libertarian in our province. And he said, if you want to look for someone to blame, it is democracy. So he said, why? Because democracy creates this illusion that all the major decisions people have to make in their life is this thing that was five, five uh, sorry, once every five years, you choose one politician and everything gonna be all right and then like that. So, but, well, I love democracy, it's fun. It's a fun thing that we, several years to make campaign, but, and it's also moral for my point of view. How do you reconcile those things? Because it's not democracy per se that is the problem, it's unlimited democracy. That's the key issue. To have a democratic principle where we vote for who's going to be uh, our representative in parliament and so on, is a way that we choose representation. But it should be in the context of a limited constitution. For example, some things should not be a matter for majority choice. For instance, what religion do we follow? Should it be your religion or my religion? If we have a vote on that, it's a civil war. That should not be a matter for democratic decision. That's a matter of personal relationship to God, whether you worship and how. And I think also things like drugs should not be on the agenda of democratic choice. But there might be some things like what is the best legal system, how to defend the nation in case of foreign attack, where some democratic representation is the best way to do it, or the least bad. Might be a more modest way to put it. Uh, but the problem is not democracy per se. The problem is when a democratic majority has unlimited power. And the liberal or libertarian response is to limit power. Not only of kings and dictators, but also the power of majorities. With that, I want to be responsible. My time is over, and I have to stop now. Thank you very much.